Hello everybody, welcome to my Spanish Grand Prix review. My name's Aaron, this is the Five Red Lights, and let's discuss what went down in Barcelona after the Five Red Lights went out. One light, two lights, three lights, four lights, five lights, and it's go, 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 go! So it's Lewis Hamilton that took victory number 98 after a strategic chess match with Max Verstappen. He lost the lead at the start but was able to track his opponent in the opening laps. Mercedes gave him a five lap tyre offset before pitting a second time to provide the world champion with a massive tyre advantage. This win increases his championship lead to 14 points. Red Bull though will rue Sergio Perez's poor weekend, who finished behind Charles Leclerc, who finished fourth on a good weekend for Ferrari, who outscored McLaren. It was a bad home race for Fernando Alonso, who struggled with his one stop strategy and finished a lowly 17th, while fellow Spaniard Carlos Sainz managed 7th. So that's a quick summary of the race. Let's get into what you said on Twitter. And we're going to start with John T from at John T's Corner. He gave it an 8.5 by Barcelona's standards, an overall of 6.5. When the wheels came off, scored the race at 7.5. F1 Hotspot said, I enjoyed it. There wasn't a point where it was boring, waiting for something to happen. Rayan F1 gave it 4 out of 10, claiming that he almost fell asleep many times. Meme Master gave it a 7. And Yuki Sonoda fan Anita gave it a 1 out of 10. Although I think that's because Yuki uh, only lasted a few laps. I rated the race at an 8 because it was much more interesting to watch than it was expected to be. I felt there was something everywhere to keep the viewers engaged in what was happening. The addition of the Mercedes to FI radio was excellent. More of that please. Uh, the strategy was quite fluid as well, with some teams braving it out on a one-stop, but those who went for a second change of tyres coming through the field, of course, with the aid of DRS. Ultimately, though, a battle at the front is what made this race. I think back to 2011, where Lewis Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel were fighting for the win. Hamilton couldn't get past the Red Bull man on that day, but it was still a very intense race and very intriguing to watch. This time, we saw the lead change hands twice, which was vital. Of course, had Lewis led out of Turn 1, we definitely wouldn't have seen a race as good as we did. Lewis might have lost the lead of the race at Turn 1, where Max was again very forceful in taking the advantage, but it was almost inevitable that Mercedes would find a way around the Red Bull. Mercedes, in Lewis's hands at least, was the faster race car, and he was more than happy to play the long game, as he said, after the race. Now, in years previous, We've obviously we've seen and heard Mercedes struggling desperately when they're behind another car. But so far in 2021, Lewis has actually been able to stick with Max when stuck behind in the turbulent air. And we've seen that with Bottas as well. He's been able to sit there and not get stuck quite so much. And obviously couple that with Lewis's ability to keep the tyres intact and then deliver on a strategy when called upon like he did in Bahrain and like he did uh, here in Spain. Mercedes were then able to snooker Red Bull and Max Verstappen. It was essentially a repeat of the 2019 Hungarian Grand Prix as Hamilton and Verstappen opened up a gap to the rest of the pack with Bottas somewhere in the middle. And without that gap, Hamilton would have had to work extremely hard indeed to get the win. He may even have been unable to find a way through. But Mercedes spotted the gap and they seized their chance to pit first um, before Red Bull gave Max the advantage. And just as in Budapest, Red Bull either chose not to react or were unable to react and then Hamilton ended up closing Max down hand over fist. I feel like Red Bull need to sharpen up their game in this regard because Max and Lewis were so regularly over a second a lap faster than, than Charles Leclerc who was bottling up Bottas in the early stages so, so this gap was always going to emerge at some point and they need to preempt that. They need to be forward thinking. This is a Red Bull team that when they've in the past been on Mercedes' tail, they've forced a strategy. If they go in to these opening races, try and force Mercedes onto the back foot, and they still come out second best, I don't think people will be quite so critical of them. This one, they're they're not putting any pressure on Mercedes, and they're just almost waiting to be to be beaten, which is really disappointing. I think um, from a team that we know can be very crafty on the strategy and if they put all this pressure on all this pressure on Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton we've already seen that Verstappen can come out on top in combat with Lewis so if 
Red Bull can give him the tools to do that, he can turn the tide on Lewis in this championship battle. But as it was uh, this weekend, Max was cornered again by Mercedes' strategical supremacy and Hamilton's brilliance. 100 poles for Lewis now and 100 wins is uh, on the horizon. Max now under pressure to deliver in Monaco. OK, it's only 14 points, the gap at the top, but, you know, if Hamilton keeps edging out six, seven, eight points, if they keep finishing first and second, that gap is soon going to be over a win and Red Bull will be really on the back foot. Let's talk about the teammates of Verstappen and Hamilton, which are, of course, Sergio Perez and Valtteri Bottas. Both of them are probably out of title contention already. We've only had four races, and Bottas is, has only scored half the points of Lewis, and Perez is not even in the top four of the World Championship. I think Bottas, he he's really suffering from that Imola, that race weekend there, because he, even if he hadn't been crashed into by George Russell, then he would have scored minimal points. So he just seems to be stuck, essentially, there. And that showed, because he got absolutely mugged at Turn 3 by Leclerc, when really he should have been the one pouncing on Hamilton being wrong-footed by Verstappen. And from there, he was bottled up behind the Ferrari. He did manage to pit-stop his way past, and, and then was right behind Hamilton after the first round of stops. And of course, Lewis has fresher tyres at this point, but Bottas still didn't make much of an impression on Verstappen in the lead. And they were on a similar um, tyre strategy in terms of tyre life. The team asked him to pick up the pace, and he couldn't really respond, as he remained roughly 10 seconds adrift of Verstappen once they asked him to, to pick up the pace. And for me, this is just another underscore on why Bottas clearly is not the man to lead Mercedes in a title battle with another team. He might come out on top if it's just between the two Mercedes drivers, and, that, and the, driver, the other driver isn't Lewis Hamilton. Um, but he's just not. He's just not. He's just not got it. It's 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 a very strange thing. You know, the, some of these drivers look like world champion material when they burst onto the scene and in their early careers. But when you put them in the situation, they just they just cannot deliver. And that that. I don't know whether that's a limit of skill or just a, a limit of uh, psychological capacity. Obviously, we're on Bottas uh, 150.0, I think. So how many more evolutions can he go through? And also, he could have really heavily compromised Hamilton's charge for victory, which I think was was poor from Valtteri. And OK, he claimed he was running his own race, and that's completely fair enough. But he was not going to win this race. He was 10 seconds behind Verstappen. And I don't think he'd have closed, he would have closed that gap uh, even if he was running second to the flag. He should have just let Lewis buy the earliest opportunity and take the slipstream from his teammate. Luckily, as it was, it cost the team nothing because Hamilton went on to took the win. But Valtteri could have compromised the team very, very heavily there. He certainly fared better than Sergio Perez. Sergio struggled in qualifying, citing issues with his shoulder and dizzy spells because of that. And the race wasn't much better. And he was absolutely no help to Max in his fight with the Mercedes. He fought through from, I think, eighth on the grid and he ended up fifth, but he was still behind Charles Leclerc. OK, Spain is not the easiest track to overtake on, but this is the problem that Alex Albon ran into so often last year in the Red Bull. He would qualify out of position and get stuck in the midfield and at best be reaching fourth or fifth. And in no way was he able to help Max against the Mercedes. If Perez, like he was in Portimao, is 10 seconds off of third place, that's not great because he's not there to properly disrupt the Mercedes, but it stops them having that free stop. And proof again when Hamilton boxed for that second set of tyres and Verstappen was left helpless so okay you could say that Red Bull could have pitted Max first but then their second driver needs to be doing the job and it comes back to that question of can Red Bull actually run 
two cars. Okay, Sergio is new to the car, but he's an experienced driver. I think he should be getting a bit more than he is out of that car. I don't think he should be winning races, and obviously I predicted him to finish on the podium, and yet again I brought him some bad luck, so maybe I'll steer clear of that. But even then, if you... If you if you're hoping for third in a Red Bull, you need to be finishing at least fourth and not fighting through to fifth. And if you're fighting through to fifth, you know, at least have had a catastrophe in qualifying with an engine issue or something or been taken out at the first corner. But for Sergio, it's just very underwhelming and disappointing that he performed so almost, almost lacklusterly. His overtake on Ricardo was, was good, but that was probably about as good as it got all weekend for Sergio, so much better required from him in Monte Carlo. There was a big battle at the front, of course, but the midfield was chaotic as normal, and Ferrari came out as best of the rest. Charles Leclerc nailed the start, had excellent pace to take a comfortable P4 at the flag, but unfortunately Carlos Sainz made a poor start at his home race and found himself a little bit stuck. He spent most of the race behind Daniel Ricciardo uh, chasing the McLaren's gearbox and ended up taking a, a solid 7th place, which, okay, on the face of it isn't great, but like we said with Perez, a, a driver adapting uh, to a new car. Carlos has adapted well in the case of Sergio Perez. He's not adapted quite so well. Um, and Carlos is getting points. He's scoring the finishes that he should be should be scoring. McLaren, they were outscored by Ferrari for the first time this season as they could only manage 6th and 8th with Daniel Ricciardo finishing ahead of Lando Norris for the first time this season. I feel like Lando really paid for not performing very well in Q3. I think he only managed ninth on the grid. A team that did perform well in qualifying was Alpine. They looked set for a decent result after Esteban Ocon started fifth on the grid, but they fell away in the race. They just lacked a little bit of race pace. Esteban lost places at the start. He dropped from fifth to seventh and ended up coming home in ninth, while Fernando Alonso says he had lots of fun, but he battled a one-stop strategy and was eventually gobbled up by Lance Stroll and Pierre Gasly towards the end, ended up finishing 17th after stopping for fresh tyres. Aston Martin, they scored no points, with Lance Stroll in 11th and Sebastian Vettel in 13th. But on the plus side, I felt they looked a bit stronger this weekend and closer to that group of Alpine, Alpha Tauri in the midfield. I think Ferrari and McLaren are just a, a little bit out of reach for those those three teams. But like picking up the, the scrappy points, the, the 8th, 9th, 10th places, that's where uh, those three will, will battle each other. And perhaps the odd 11th place could be crucial. So... If you're not going to finish 10th, make sure you've got a car finishing 11th because that will just pop you up one place in the constructors, perhaps just on count back. Alpha Tauri, they rescued a point after Pierre Gasly picked up a penalty for overshooting his grid box at the start. And Yuki Tsunoda broke down after just a handful of laps. Uh, a tricky weekend for Yuki. He had that bit of rant in the uh, press pen after qualifying, after being eliminated in Q1. Not smart from him. Did apologise, but he's got a lot of learning to do and it just it just shows you know he was excellent in F2 last season but F1 is just a different kettle of fish and he's just just needs a clean weekend at all he just needs a, a series of clean weekends um, to get him started and he'll learn it's just a very very steep learning curve moving further towards the back of the grid then we've got Kimi Raikkonen who finished 12th for Alfa Romeo he actually did the contra one stop strategy starting on the mediums and finishing on the softs and he ran really well uh, in the Alfa Romeo he did qualify behind his teammate Giovinazzi who lost out after a messy pit stop behind the safety car and he brought the car home in 15th I believe George Russell picked up 14th place for Williams and was actually in and out of the points throughout the race uh, while his teammate Nicholas Latifi finished in 16th Unfortunately for George, he couldn't hang on uh, to that position in the points. And he was actually chasing Alonso while Alonso was battling that one-stop strategy. Uh, but George was also on aging tyres and he was uh, dropped down the order too. And we'll conclude this little roundup with Haas. They finished 18th and 19th with Mick Schumacher beating Nikita Mazepin again. <laughs> Let's 
just run through some standout performers. Of course, Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen were in a class of their own at the front. And of course, Charles Leclerc was the top man in midfield. Esteban Ocon's qualifying lap was an excellent performance. Alpine just lacked the race pace. Uh, Pierre Gasly, he performed well to recover from that five second penalty early on in the race. Uh, in fact, it actually helped him because he got the undercut on the uh, rest of the midfield. And that helped him because he, he, he was then almost committed to a two stop strategy. Daniel Ricciardo, though, uh, also stood out, performing much more comfortably for McLaren, be uh, besting his teammate Lando Norris for the first time. OK, so it's time for the data analysis with uh, Formula One Trends. This is courtesy of at F1 Trends on Twitter. Uh, F1Trends.com uh, is their website. It's run by uh, Shafi. Go and check them out because um, they've got lots of data on their Twitter feed for you to, to have a look at from each race. So it could be race data like we've got here, uh, some qualifying data perhaps. Um, so I found this piece really interesting. It's a bit of race data and it's a theoretical versus recorded best lap time. So essentially what has been done here, a theoretical best lap has been calculated by putting together the best individual sector times uh, from the race. So the best sector one, the best sector two, and best sector three times uh, for each driver. So we've got Hamilton, Verstappen, Bottas, Leclerc, Perez, Ricardo, Sainz, and Lando Norris. So this gives a theoretical uh, best potential lap time, possible fastest lap uh, that each driver was able to do. And also you've got uh, the plotted uh, dots of the actual lap times that each driver was able to produce. So the green uh, hexagon is the theoretical best lap race, uh, best race lap, sorry. And the red triangle is the, is the actual uh, best lap that each driver produced. So let's have a look at Lewis Hamilton. If you see where his uh, green hexagon is, it's actually slightly below his actual best lap. So there was potentially more lap time for Lewis to find. But if you have a look at the majority of his uh, turquoise uh, circles, they're fairly close to his actual best time. Now, if you flip that to Verstappen, he has a much lower potential fastest lap which he actually managed to achieve so that he actually reached his maximum pace on an occasion but then if you look at the rest of his dots above that they're much further away now max did set off at a very hot pace in the early stages and that contributed to his probable uh decline in speed because Obviously, his tyres were wearing, and the Mercedes keeps its tyres in uh, an operating window and a workable usage, uh, a lot better than the Red Bull is at the moment. So you can see there's a massive disparity between the theoretical and actual best lap time that Max done in the race and what he was then able to consistently achieve, which was most of the time actually behind what Lewis was achieving. So I'll just zoom in on what I am referring to. So I know you can't see my cursor here, so I might just pop in a few arrows in the post edit. But if you have a look at the spread of Verstappen's lap times, they are generally more grouped together because he's running at a more consistent pace, but he's actually running at a lower pace. Lewis is running at around 84, between 84 and 82 and a half seconds, a little bit, but most of his laps are just below 81 and in between the 81 and 82 and a half range, whereas Max is spread fairly evenly across the, um, the, 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 the divide of 82 and a half seconds. And then he's got a few uh, down here where he is a little bit quicker and he's approaching 79 and a half seconds for a lap. So I found that really interesting because that, that tells you just how much Hamilton had in hand, uh, potentially. And back, the data backs up the, the, the fact that we saw that the, that the uh, Mercedes driven by Lewis was the better race car. And if you look at the, the plots for Valtteri Bottas, here's a kind of similar in, their, their, in respect to Max. He's got 
a few laps that are faster. He matched his ultimate theoretical best, but most of his laps were some distance off of that, which meant he was matching Max. If, if he'd not lost position to Leclerc at the start, he would have been in the fight. But this is the problem for Bottas. He is losing places at the start or dropping back early on, and he's then only matching what Max is able to do in the Red Bull and isn't able to keep up with what Lewis is achieving in the same equipment. And therein lies his big issue. And that's why Lewis is the difference maker, because if you look at his his spread of laps across uh, the race and compare them to Valtteri's, Lewis's are much more closely grouped, whereas Valtteri's are a lot more spread out. And then again with Sergio Perez, Probably about the same pace as Valtteri. Again, a bigger spread, a much bigger spread because he was caught in so much traffic and having to run at a slower pace. So the, the battle at the front is very close. And you can see from this data who is making the difference. And at the moment, it is Lewis Hamilton. If we just have a quick glance at the Ferrari and McLaren uh, dots, so Charles finishing in P4, class of his own. But then you look at the spread. If you just look at the general spread of the uh, Ferrari and the McLarens, they're, they're actually very similarly plotted. Again, fairly close to their maximum lap times. Daniel Ricciardo had a little bit left in hand. Uh, Carlos Sainz and Lando Norris didn't quite reach their full maximum potential. Charles managed to uh, get the closest to maximum potential so you can really see just how close those two cars are and it's going to be a fascinating battle both at the front between uh, Mercedes and Red Bull and between Ferrari and McLaren because both are both pairs of cars are similarly leveled in terms of out and out pace and going around Barcelona is a really good um, yardstick for this because it's obviously where they test and we can read quite a lot into it because the car generally needs to handle fairly well through the fast corners and there's majority medium fast corners in Formula 1 circuits but obviously it's got that slow final sector which is a good indicator of pace for Monaco. Now I don't have that data here this is just an overall lap count uh, data so you can see just how evenly matched uh, all four of these teams are against their direct opponent, which is going to make the two battles for the top two positions and third and fourth in the Constructors' Championship incredibly interesting and likely go all the way down to the wire. So that was some race data analysis courtesy of Formula One Trends. Go and check out Shafee. I'll leave a link uh, to his uh, Twitter and website in the description down below. So there you have it, there's my review of the Spanish Grand Prix. Lewis Hamilton coming out on top, extending his championship lead further. We're heading to Monte Carlo next. Unfortunately, unless it rains, I don't see um, Monaco serving up a surprisingly exciting race uh, like Spain did. But you never know, you can always roll the dice in Monaco and see what comes up. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, and if you're new around here, consider subscribing. Um, I put out my choice of best Lewis Hamilton pole position laps over the weekend as well, so I'll leave a link to that at the end. Uh, go and check that out. Uh, I've also been doing some drive crate unboxing, so go and check that out. And we've got the driver of the month award. The vote for that this month will be opening uh, around the time of the Monaco Grand Prix, so just start getting some thoughts together for that thanks for watching that's all for today my name's Aaron this has been the Fire Red Lights and I'll see you on the Fire Red Lights go out bye for now